validate with the sender. If it's a friend or colleague that has sent you something with a link or attachment that you didn't request, then use a different medium to contact them and validate that they sent it. If it's sent from a company like your bank or a social site, you should contact them too if it's possible to confirm the legitimacy. If it's from a company or person you have no relationship with, then be immediately suspicious. Check the domain name of the email address that it has been sent from. If it's not the domain of the company and it is something like Hotmail or Gmail, then it's definitely fake. Companies can afford their own domain names. They don't need to use Yahoo or Gmail or Hotmail. Copy the email contents and paste it into your favorite search engine. But be careful not to click on any link. If it's a known attack, it will be found by your search engine if it's an attack that's been out for a few days. If it's a brand new attack, it may not come up in the search engine results. But here we can see phishing scam straight away. And you will get that for many of the phishing emails that you get because they are identified by the security companies fairly quickly. There's often an option to view the raw email and email headers that you've received depending on the email client that you've got. So this is an option that isn't always available within webmail, but if you do have it, say it's in Thunderbird or Mail for OS X, then you can look at this. You can examine the content and see whether it matches what it's claiming to be. And to make that easier, you can use this site, parsmail.org. Let's copy this. Paste it into here. Click this. Five minutes. Submit. So here's just an example of an email that I've got. This is actually a legitimate email. So if this was from a company like this is, I can check out things like its IP address, where it's come from, the various domains, and see whether that is actually genuinely associated with that company. You can do a search for the company name and see if it has a legitimate internet presence, see if it has their own site, their own telephone numbers to call. If not, it's likely to be fake. If they do have a website, does it have a private listing in Whois? You can go to any of the Whois services to do a search for this. But if you go for this one, just picked an example here, blob.com, do a search. And let's have a look at blob.com. And we can see here that blob.com is using a privacy protection service, which means it's hiding who the owner is. A private listing is okay for a personal website or a blog or an information only website. If it is a private listing, then this could be a sign that something's a bit off because mostly businesses that are selling something will have non-private listings. It should identify the company that owns the domain or the person that owns the domain. Example being the BBC here, so you can see the full details of who owns the BBC, the company, the address, the registered address, etc. That's the sort of information you'd want to see from a Whois result. If you look here, you can also do a reverse IP address lookup. So this is the IP address of the server in relation to this domain name, blob.com. If we do a reverse look upon it, we can see what other domains are associated with this IP address. And we can see here it's listed three and another 1.1 million other domains. So that is extremely unusual. But what you can do here is you can look to see whether any of these other domains are suspicious. So you could Google these domains as well, and that will be an indicator as to whether the main domain that you had, blob.com in this case, is a legitimate domain. Also, you can just look at the general characteristics of the website. Does the site look like it's been quickly put together? Do the links on the website work? Are there unrelated photos or content? Do the pictures, links, and contents on the page match? And the theme and purpose of the page and website all go together? Is the information vague or inaccurate if they're trying to sell you something? You can determine if something's cloned by copying and pasting parts of the site into your favorite search engine and see whether the site has been cloned. Again, that gives you an indicator as to whether or not it's some sort of scam. Another warning sign is a redirect. So if you typed in the URL or you clicked on the link, 
and then it forwards you to somewhere else. That's a sign of a scam as well. You should validate any attachment that is with the message. So never download and run any file you don't 100% trust, as I've said. You can use Total Virus to check if the attachment is a known malware by forwarding the email to scan at virustotal.com. Check out this link here, follow the instructions that are on it, and that'll show you how you can forward your email to VirusTotal for it to be checked. But essentially you can just forward send it to scan at virustotal.com and send. But read this to make sure you're doing the latest thing that they're requesting you to do. This isn't obviously a completely conclusive check as antiviruses are flawed. They only know known viruses. If it shows as clear, it still can be malware and maybe custom malware for you or just very new malware. But if it shows as infected, then obviously it should be avoided. What you see here is a non-exhaustive list of executable file types. You should absolutely never ever run any of these unless you are 100% sure that you trust the source. These are all programs so have the power to do anything on your computer if you run them. This is a list of the file extensions so this will be at the end of the file so it will be filename.exe.com.vb and this is a list of document extensions that also should be avoided. These can contain executable macro viruses, so you should be very careful when running these. Excel, Word, Adobe in particular can contain these viruses, so be careful about running these. These are some of the compression and file archive extensions. These are often used to hide executables. So be careful with these too, as you might find executable files within the archive if you unarchive it. And finally, these are a list of what are probably safe extensions, .txt, .gif, .jpg. But it is possible that these could exploit a flaw if the software you use to view them has a vulnerability in it. But it's quite unlikely. And finally, we'll finish off with some of the obvious stuff. It is obvious, but you know, I've got to say it anyway, just to cover it. If the requester asks for bank account information, credit card numbers, your mother's maiden name or other personal information, then obviously that is fake. They're not going to be sending you that in an email or a message. If they send something to you saying you've won a prize, you have won the Nigerian lottery or a prince has contacted you and he wants to desperately send you money, obviously these are all fakes, ignore. If it contains a lot of hype and exaggerations, but few facts and details about costs, your obligations and how it actually works, that's a sign of a scam too. If you ask for a fee for administration, processing, taxes to be paid in advance, Never provide money in advance of receiving anything. This is the advanced fee scam. Technical support will never ask you for your username and password. That's a scam. Don't put USBs or CDs into your computer you don't trust, especially if you found them on the floor. Be suspicious of anything that seems to be too good to be true. It probably is. If you discover a scam email or link or phishing email or spam, forward the spam emails onto this email address here to help stop spam. If you received a bad email that's reportedly from a company, you can send a copy of that email to the company in order to help them prevent the attack. If you have a phishing email, you can send it to this email here. This is the anti-phishing work group. This will help fight phishing attacks. On vishing and uh, phone calls and phone cons, one of the best ways to protect against vishing attacks is to have a way to confirm with whom you are speaking. Do not provide any information to an unknown caller, even if there is a caller ID that looks legitimate because these can be faked. With vishing and phone calls, always have the caller validate their identity. Ask for their name, ask for the company name, ask for their title and phone number to call them back. More advanced attackers will have a legitimate number to call back. So verify the company by searching the internet and doing the various checks that we've already gone through. Validate that the company and everything associated with it is legitimate. Search online for everything that they've said to validate who they are and what they are claiming. When it comes to offline, to reduce the risk of being a target, buy and use a paper shredder. Anything with personal information should be shredded. 
Don't carry your social security card with you and make sure you report lost or stolen checks and credit cards immediately. So these are the behavioral changes, or perhaps these are not changes for those of you who are already doing these things that can help mitigate against social attacks like phishing, vishing, smishing, spam, scams, and cons.